We've been talking to you for several months about the paper Michael Kazaka is working on, founder of crypto payment consultancy value chain on the energy efficiency of crypto, and specifically Bitcoin compared to the traditional banking system. Well, it's finally ready, and in my opinion, you won't be disappointed with the results. Before we start, a little aside, as you probably already know, we have been working for a few months with Sebastian Gispiu and our friends at Real IT to create a Bitcoin mining container tokenization company. It's called CleanSat Mining. For now, the site only allows you to get some information and sign up to be kept informed. But the official launch is coming very soon. I think you understand the objective of this company to allow anyone to invest in Bitcoin mining and participate in this technological, ecological, monetary, and social revolution. And well, as a symbol, the first Bitcoin transaction made with the CleanSat mining wallet will contain the hash of Michael's article because this paper contains the academic justification of the interest of CleanSat mining, namely mining Bitcoin on exclusively green extra energy capacity and never at the expense of the energy needs of local populations. In short, clean mining from every angle. That being said, let's go. For several years, Bitcoin has been criticized for its energy consumption and its impact on the environment. The proof of work, the technological building block on which the protocol is based and which allows the network to be synchronized and secured, is said to be an environmental aberration. You're probably familiar with these kinds of headlines. And then what the media likes to do most of all is to compare Bitcoin's electricity needs to those of an entire country. Here's what the prestigious New York Times had to say. On this graph, we can see that Satoshi Nakamoto's invention apparently consumes more than Chile, Denmark, or even Finland. Of course, this kind of comparison makes absolutely no sense. It's like putting your car's fuel consumption side by side with that of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Of course, one consumes much more than the other, but they do not serve the same purpose. The first one allows you to go to the bakery, while the other one catapults about 10 tons of cargo into orbit around the Earth. Let's face it. Most of the reports and articles putting Bitcoin on trial use assumptions and calculation methodologies that are often flawed. They make all sorts of shortcuts and extrapolations that are completely wrong, often demonstrating a total incomprehension of the subject. For example, it is completely absurd to compare Bitcoin to Visa or MasterCard. They are completely different creatures. Bitcoin is a payment network with its own currency, and it is important to remember that a transaction on the Bitcoin network is final. Whereas, this is absolutely not the case when you pay with your visa. There are more than a dozen intermediaries and the payment can take up to 15 days to actually be completed. Satoshi Nakamoto's invention is an easy target because its energy consumption and environmental impact are easily calculable. Correction, seem easily calculable. It is actually very difficult to accurately map all the mining sites currently in operation and identify what kind of energy they consume something that is essential if you really want to calculate the CO2 emissions of the network. In short, as you will recall, we have already made several videos on this subject to set the record straight and to dispel a number of preconceived ideas. And now we come to Michael Kazaka's paper on the energy efficiency of Bitcoin and current payment systems. In fact, the most complicated part of doing this kind of study is having knowledge of both worlds. And that's exactly the case with Michael who has more than 15 years of experience in payment systems and has been deeply interested in Bitcoin since 2010 and started lecturing on the subject in 2013. So today, he's the right person in the right place for this kind of exercise. First of all, he proposes a new calculation methodology to determine the power consumption of the Bitcoin network much more accurately. So before I explain how Michael does it, a quick reminder about proof of work. This is one of the main technological building blocks of Bitcoin. The proof of work allows the blockchain to be synchronized and secured. Many people often make the mistake of saying that miners are used to verify transactions. This is not true. Transactions are verified by all the nodes in the network. That is, all the people who have Bitcoin.core software on the computer. It is quite complicated to say how many nodes there are exactly, because not all of them are visible. But you can see on this map of bit nodes that there are at least 14,000 Bitcoin nodes scattered all over the planet. A puzzle is a very good analogy to illustrate the interaction between miners and validators, i.e. nodes. A puzzle is quite long to do, 
you have to find where the different pieces are placed so that the image finally appears. On the other hand, checking that the puzzle is well done is almost immediate and requires very little effort. So to summarize, the miners do the puzzle, the famous proof of work, and the nodes verify it. Thanks to this system, the whole network can synchronize every 10 minutes on the state of the blockchain, i.e. on the balance of all users. Basically, who owns what? But it also ensures that a transaction written in the blockchain can never be erased or modified afterwards. This is the famous immutability of Bitcoin. Of course, miners do not do the puzzle by hand, but use specific machines called ASICs that can try several billion combinations per second. For your information, a combination is called a hash, and the speed of these machines is measured in hash second or hash rate. As soon as one of the miners finds the solution, he is rewarded for his efforts by pocketing freshly mined bitcoins as well as the transaction fees. Today, at the current bitcoin price, the reward is about $190,000. Every day, more than $27 million is paid out in bitcoin to miners around the world. When we talk about the power consumption of the Bitcoin network, we are talking about the power consumption of all these ASICs put together. Now, like washing machines, there are several dozen of them on the market with very specific characteristics. For example, here is an S9 from Bitmade that dates back to 2017. Here is the number of combinations this computer can test each second, 13.5 trillion, so 13.5 trillion per second, for a consumption of about 1320 watts. And here is one of the latest models of the same brand, the S19 Pro, which allows to go up to 110 THS for a consumption of 3250 watts. You all have noticed that the machines are more and more powerful and efficient. From the S9 or S19, the hash rate has been multiplied by about 8, but the consumption not even by 3. Last little thing before diving into Michael's report. You should know that it is possible to calculate very precisely the total hash rate of the network i.e. the number of combinations tested each second by all the machines connected to the network. Finally, I won't go into any detail, but basically we also know the size of the puzzle since it is a variable that it is part of the protocol. It is called the mining difficulty or network difficulty. You can see on this graph how the size of the puzzle that miners have to solve has evolved since 2009. As you know, this puzzle is automatically adjusted from time to time so that the solution is found about every 10 minutes. So, if you have the size of the puzzle, or more precisely the number of possible combinations as well as the time the miners took to find the solution, you can deduce the total power of the network. This is the famous total hash rate of Bitcoin, which is currently about 210 EHS. But let's be clear, with this total hash rate, we don't know the precise composition of the miners pool. Again, let's use an analogy to illustrate the concept. If someone tells you they did an addition and came up with the number 10, you don't know if the calculation looked like this, or this, or even this. Well, it's the same with the total hash rate. We know it's 210 EHS, but we don't know what proportion of S9 or S19, for example, is behind it. And this is precisely the information we need to calculate the network consumption, because as we said, each machine has very different characteristics, especially in terms of their power requirements. So, that's the main problem when trying to calculate the power consumption of the Crypto Queens network, identifying the machines that are mining Bitcoin today. With this information, you have the power of the different ASICs, so their yearly consumption. And here we are only calculating the electricity consumption of the network, not its environmental impact, which would require knowing, in addition, how the electricity used at the different mining sites was produced, and or whether this electricity was surplus or produced specifically to mine Bitcoin. In short, you can see that this is a much more complicated exercise than it seems. Several research institutes have obviously tried to find a solution to this problem. Cambridge, for example, which is regularly quoted with its Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index, is based on the work of Mark Bevant to determine the types of machines used and to calculate the consumption of the network. The method is relatively simple and is based on the profitability of the machines. The main assumption is that a miner runs his ASICs only if he earns more in Bitcoin than he pays in electricity. With this, Cambridge was able to obtain a high and low range of Bitcoin consumption. The low range, here about 52 TWH, corresponds to a situation where all miners are using the latest, best and most efficient ASICs. Basically, there are S19 Pros everywhere. The high range, where 232 TWH corresponds to a completely opposite situation where the miners use the oldest but still efficient ASICs. Then, 
Cambridge cuts the figure in half and with some additional assumptions arrives at an average estimate of about 120 TWH. However, as you will have understood, this method depends fundamentally on the cost of electricity you use in your formula to know which machine remains profitable or not. If you take 1 kilowatt hour at 3 cents or 20 cents, you will get very different results. Cambridge therefore assumed a world average electricity cost of 5 cents per kilowatt hour. However, we know that electricity costs can vary significantly from country to country, region to region, and supplier to supplier. Prices are generally dynamic and adjustable, often depending on seasonal circumstances, the amount of electricity consumed, and many other factors. Without going into the details of the business, we know, for example, that BBGS, Sebastian Gispiu's mining company that uses untapped renewable energy around the world, manages to get electricity under 5 cents per kilowatt hour. In short, the Cambridge Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index has been useful in recent years to give an order of magnitude to Bitcoin's consumption, a fairly wide range. But there is clearly room for improvement and refinement. The question, how much does Bitcoin really consume is still open? And that's where Michael Kazaka comes in. Instead of using certain assumptions about the price of electricity and the profitability of the machines, he relied on the average lifespan of ASICs as well as on existing models of the speed of diffusion of new hardware. So what does this mean in concrete terms? There are a number of studies today showing how quickly hardware such as smartphones or computers enter and spread in the market by acquiring new users or replacing existing hardware. The number of units of a new device follows a normal or Gaussian curve relatively well. Michael discussed at length with experts in the field such as Sebastian Gispiu to refine the parameters of the model and obtain something that best reflects the reality of the field. After several months of work and research, it seemed correct and relatively conservative to consider the average useful life of an ASIC at 2.5 years and the maximum useful life at 5 years. So we won't go into more detail about the calculations that are done after this step because it would be quite long to explain, but for those who are interested, we will of course leave a link to the report in the video description. At the end, here is the result. You can see on this graph a simulation of the evolution of the number of units on the network of the 92 types of ASICs existing to date. So we have a relatively accurate estimate of the consumption of the market at a time. Basically, we know how many units of each type of ASICs there are in the world. Pretty cool, huh? The hardest part was done. By knowing the distribution of the mining park in its entirety as well as the characteristics of each model, Michael was able to calculate the total consumption of the network quite easily. And drumroll, we arrive at a figure of 89 TWH per year, which is perfectly consistent with Cambridge's calculations. But thanks to this new method, we notice that the crypto queen is rather in the low range of the previous index. But Michael didn't stop there. In addition to refining the power consumption of the Bitcoin network with a new method, he wanted to estimate the energy needs of traditional payment systems. And this is an exercise that few people are able to do because it requires a great knowledge of payment systems, the banking system and the financial system. Of course, this exercise cannot be exhaustive. There are far too many parameters and variables to take into account to arrive at an accurate figure. However, it seemed quite possible and interesting to take into account a number of elements necessary for the current system and to see their respective consumption in comparison to Bitcoin. Michael dedicates a large part of the report to estimating the energy needed the creation and printing of coins and banknotes, the distribution of these banknotes, cash transportation such as Brinks or Loomis, payment terminals and shops, networks like Visa or MasterCard, bank offices around the world, and their servers, the interbank network. But what really makes the bill explode is the homework home journeys of the banking sector employees. For a little anecdote, Richard and Sebastian were already talking about it in the very first video together more than a year ago. If you want to have the details of the calculations and the assumptions made to arrive at these results, I strongly invite you to consult the report. Here I have just put the different sections with their consumption, but there is a huge research work behind it. Everything is explained in the paper, with the references on which Michael relies, of course. In any case, if we add up all these elements, traditional payment systems would consume at least 5,000 TWH per year. That's about 60 times the total consumption of Bitcoin. We are absolutely not on the same orders of magnitude. Some will say that the comparison is not necessarily fair because, for example, the daily commute of people working for the mining industry or the energy used to ventilate or light the buildings in which the ASICs are located were not included. True. However, given the size of the mining industry at the moment, compared to the traditional banking sector, these elements are marginal and were set aside for this study. Furthermore, the environmental impact of e-waste was not considered here. 
This is another topic and was therefore also admitted for Bitcoin in the banking sector. Based on these figures, Michael then wanted to compare the efficiency and power of both systems by analyzing their respective energy consumption per transaction. To be clear, this notion of energy consumption per transaction made no sense when comparing Visa to Bitcoin, for example. That's comparing a car to a rocket ship. On the other hand, comparing the traditional payment systems industry as a whole with Bitcoin is completely different. We now have two tools that perform the same functions. Basically, here we are comparing two rockets to each other, and we want to know their respective energy efficiency to catapult a payload into space. So, we'll take their energy consumption and divide it by the weight they managed to carry. This gives us the amount of energy spent per kilogram. Thanks to this, we can now know which of their two rockets is the most efficient. We can also look at the power of each ones by calculating the time they take to reach space. Well, Michael applied exactly the same method to Bitcoin and the traditional payment systems industry, taking into account that a transaction on Bitcoin was completed in 10 minutes on average, whereas it takes two days on average in the current banking system. If two days seems like a long time, keep in mind that when the money appears in your account or you have paid the merchant with your credit card, the transaction is not necessarily complete. This is precisely what allows you, for example, to recall a transfer or to stop certain payments made with your Visa or MasterCard. There's a whole series of steps behind the scenes that you don't see. With Bitcoin, in about 10 minutes, the transaction is really, really done. Even though it is often recommended to wait for two or three blocks to be 100% sure that the transaction will never be changed again. In the end, the conclusion of the paper is that, in its current state, Bitcoin is already 20% more efficient than the traditional system. I specify in its current state because the blocks are not currently full, and the network could therefore process more transactions without increasing its energy consumption. Think of Bitcoin as a refrigerator that consumes the same amount of energy, whether it's full or empty. It's exactly the same with blocks. Bitcoin consumes the same amount of energy whether it is half empty or very full. Michael concludes by mentioning, of course, the Lightning Network and the potential of this overlay to increase Bitcoin's transaction capabilities almost infinitely without increasing the consumption of the main network. By including the Lightning Network in the calculations, Bitcoin becomes several million times more efficient than the current system. So let's look at this chart again. In summary, current payment systems can process 100,000 transactions per second at maximum capacity. Bitcoin plus LN can process 10 times that number, or 1 million transactions per second. However, LN solves a transaction in less than a second, while the payment system industry needs two days to process a transaction. So compare BTC plus LN to the instant payment solution offered by banks that make a payment in about 7 seconds. Here, however, it is blocked. When traditional payment systems try to accelerate, they are limited to 1,000 transactions per second. BTC plus LN are therefore 1,000 times more efficient for a much lower energy consumption. Strangely enough, Bitcoin has been criticized for its scaling problems, its scalability, when in fact, ironically, this is the problem with current payment systems. So obviously these figures are theoretical. In practice, the LN encounters, for example, at a given time problems of bandwidth or liquidity in the channels. But the exercise of thought is nevertheless, according to us, interesting and useful for the comparison and especially if we project ourselves on the long term. In order to remain relatively concise and clear, we have obviously only skimmed over Michael's work. If you are interested in the video, I really recommend that you read the entire paper, and if you have any question or remarks about the study, don't hesitate to post a comment under the video. Michael, Richard, and I will answer them as soon as possible. On that note, see you soon for the new videos. Ciao!